Hello church and I'm glad you're here with us if you're joining us virtually. This is a rebroadcast of my sermon because we had technical difficulties with our camera uh, on Sunday. So I'm redoing this. Uh, the first part of the sermon came in and this will probably be spliced into the middle or just uh, sent out separately. But I want to thank you for being here. This morning we're going to continue our study in the book of uh, Ephesians. And um, it's, a, it's one of the prison epistles. And we started the prison epistles a few weeks ago and we went over the book of Philippians and we fin just finished that. And it's uh, known also as the epistle of joy. And so all these epistles that we're covering now, as the name would suggest, are epistles that were written while Paul was in prison. Not a very joyful place, you might say, but Paul said that he had found a way to find joy in whatever circumstance he was in. As our background goes, we saw Paul started this church in Ephesus on his second missionary journey. And on his third missionary journey, he came back and he stayed there for three years. And in that three-year time, we looked at Acts and, and it recorded all the miraculous things that happened in the Ephesian church in that three-year span. God was working in miraculous ways. People were getting saved. People were getting baptized. Demons were being cast out. And a lot of, uh, a lot of very dynamic things were happening while Paul was ministering to the Ephesian church. Now what I did neglect to do before um, I left my background last week when we started the book of Ephesians was to give you a key verse for the book of Ephesians. And the key verse in Ephesians is Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. It says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. And that kind of brings us to where we are today in the book of Ephesians. We started, we finished the verse 6 of chapter 1. Today we're going to chapter 1, verses 7 through 12. And it reads, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace, that he lavished onto us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mysteries of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth and under earth, under Christ. In him we, are, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of his, him who works out everything in conformity with his purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might uh, be for the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you for your word. I pray you'll bless it now. God, convict us where we need conviction. Encourage us where we need encouragement. And let us leave this service better equipped to serve you. In Christ's name, amen. It starts right off in verse 7 with the gospel. And it tells us there's a price on your head and Jesus paid the ransom. You have the word redeemed or, or in that verse. And it says to redeem is to set free from a penalty because a ransom has been paid. In Ephesians 1, 7 it says in him we have redemption through his blood. Each of us are prisoners of sin. We're born into a sin nature. And to have fellowship with God, we need to be redeemed from our sins. We need that penalty be paid. It says in Romans 23, 25, But there is something else deep within me, in my lower nature, that is at war with my mind and wins the fight and makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. In my mind, I want to be God's willing servant. But instead, I find myself still enslaved to sin. So you see, how is it? So you see how it is. My new life tells me to do right, but the old nature that's still inside me loves to sin. Oh, what a terrible predicament I'm in. Oh, oh who will free me from my slavery? 
uh, to this deadly lower nature. Thank God it has been done by Christ our Lord. He has set me free. You know, Jesus sets us free from our sins because of the price he paid by, his, by shedding his blood on the cross. The, Jesus' blood became that ransom that is, was enough to set us free. Jesus was without sin, and that's what made him the perfect sacrifice, and the only sacrifice could free us from sin. It says, for the wages of sin is death in Romans, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, in the Old Testament, it tells us about the atonement of sins. And the term atonement refers to a belief that Jesus dying on the cross will resolve the problems between humans and God. It says in Leviticus 17, 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh the, an atonement for the souls. You know, guys, uh, two Bible scholars, Packard and Nystrom, observed, and I, I think it's, it's true, and it's always, to me, Increase the credibility of the Bible. It's, they say this, the Bible gives us life stories of many people God used. And God's word does not leave out persons' weaknesses or moral lapses and spiritual failures in their life. God's way with these folks is to change them as he uses them and to use them while he remakes them. You know, a Christian has power to become wise and prudent far beyond human ability. It says in verse 8 that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in Christ. Yeah. When we begin to look at our life as God sees it, and we begin to other, look at other people as God see it, we have a whole new insight. The world system gives the impression that, uh, that it offers wisdom through science and law and math and all those disciplines, but God's eternal wisdom sees things from a much better vantage point than they do. Christian forgiveness, verses 7 through 8, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of of our wrongdoings according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. You know, here again, the word redeemed. Jesus paid for our sins. We belong to God, and he can do whatever he wants to do with us. Billy Graham, for some, he said, for some people, guilt is an excuse. They won't accept the forgiveness that is offered to them. It is so hard to believe it seems too good to be true that God should let us go eternally scot-free from our sins. And yes, that is the message the gospel brings to us. Point four is, it's not that kind of mystery. This isn't a murder mystery, like when you hear the word mystery you think of, or a whodunit. But it's this, he, in verse 9 it says, He made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Christ. Christians are unique. Uh, they come to know God and his will, which is number one. He, his first part of his will is to reveal his son as savior. And then eventually he's going to, as, as he comes back, he's going to reunify the world. And the result is there'll be a new heaven and a new earth where Christ is acknowledged as Lord and master by everyone. Now, unfortunately for some, It'll be too late. They'll get on their knees and they'll, they'll know when God comes back that because the Bible says every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. But for those of us that used our free will to accept Christ, now we are going to live in eternity with him in heaven. Paul repeats you, the fact that you're chosen are, pro, are predestined. We saw this in verses 1 through 6 that we studied last week. In verses 11 through 12, he says it again. He says, in him you were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him, who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were first put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. 
You know, chosen is a reference to the fact that we're made heirs and we're going to receive inheritance from God. Inheritance is a gift that somebody gives you that you have a relationship with. Uh, Christians are written into Jesus' estate and we are given many benefits here on earth and even more on, in heaven. In verse 12, we see this phrase, in order that we, you know, we refer, the we here refers to the Jews who were the first to believe they gave and gave their life to Christ through the preaching of converted Jews like Paul, who spoke in their synagogues. And then the rest of the verses in Ephesians, where you see the word we, it's going to refer to Gentiles who received Christ and the same inheritance as the Jews did. It says in 12, in order that we, who were first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. Our hope in Christ should result in praise in, to Christ. In fact, we above all others ought to have this blessed hope because God has made, made rich promises to us that come true every day. So how do we take these verses that we just went over? How do we apply them to our life in 2020? Well, first of all, I hope you leave this morning with an appreciation of what our redemption cost Jesus. The very first verse in our text today was, In Him we have redemption through His blood. You know, Oswald Chamber, in his book, My Utmost for His Highest, seemed to sum up the, this fact best when he wrote the passage of Scripture in John 17, 14, where he was commenting on Jesus' last words on the cross when he said, It is finished. And he wrote this about that. There is no place in seeing Christ, Jesus Christ as a martyr. His death was not something that happened to him. Something that might have been prevented. His death was the very reason he came. Never build your case for forgiveness on the idea that God is our Father and He will forgive us because He loves us. That contradicts the revealed truth of God in Jesus Christ. It makes the cross unnecessary and redemption much to do about nothing. God forgives sins only because of the death of Christ. God could forgive people in no other way than, to, than the death of his son. Thank God he loved us enough to send that son to die for us. In verse 9 it said, He made known to us the mysteries of his will according to his good pleasure. You know, when we pray and accept Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit that comes into our life and it reveals to us God's will in our lives. We have God's Word, the Bible, and when we know Christ, we will re He will reveal to us the things in that book that we really never realized uh, e existed there. You know, I read the book, Bible all the time, but I, it never stops to amaze me or never ceases to convict me or, or give me hope at times because the Holy Spirit works in me as I read, his, I read His Word. When you pray, the barrier of sin is removed and the lines of communication are open. You will know how to pray and what to pray for. Every morning when I come in here, if nobody's around, I just go up to the front of the church and I kneel at the first pew there and I pray for you. And I pray for people, and God gives me remembrance as I pray. To, oh, pray for Galen's heart, and you know, pray, pray, pray for, um, pray for Jan's knees, and pray for, you know, pray for this person or that person. And, and God, God brings these things into my life as I pray. Then you also need to realize, uh, thirdly, that the the cost of your redemption will be will praise Jesus for the incredible grace he lavished on you the revealed truth of his plan for a new heaven and a new earth where you will live in glorious eternity with him forever you know you can't beat a christian he's got too great a future awaiting him and then far, fourthly i know we beat this word to death but redeemed you know when i was a young guy they only had cokes and you know these glass bottles and we would uh, save them up and we would take them to the little country market for money. And then once we gave the guy the, the, the bottles, he, we redeemed them for cash. And that cash was ours to do with, them, with what we wanted to do. 
Do you realize when you are redeemed by Christ, you, are, you belong to him? You've been bought with a price, his own blood? And that's a problem for some people. They go about life convinced everything's better when they're in control. The Bible calls these people lost. And when you're lost, there's no such thing as being in control. You know, before the years of days of GPS and I was went to college, I went home with a guy on the football team who lived in Elyria, Ohio. His name was uh, Rob Slusher, and when we it came time to head back to college after th Thanksgiving, uh, we jumped in the car and, and got on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and Rob told me, just keep driving, and he would tell me when to get off the turnpike. Well, he, he fell asleep while we were driving, and when he finally woke up, we were in New Jersey. And I, I, woke, Bob, I, I woke Rob up, I said, but Rob, what are we doing in New Jersey? We had been driven for hours, and we were no closer to Lynchburg, Virginia, than when we started. And, 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 and you know, the worst thing is, and Bob, Rob woke up and says, you're right, we're lost, and I don't know how to get home from here. Yeah, the, t the passage today told us what? He lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Look what he did. He made known to us the mysteries of his will. The Bible tells us, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. In the name of control, many refuse Christ. Some out of right, outright, others have a form of godliness uh, like the rich young ruler who walked away from Christ when Christ called him out for the very thing he put before him. It said, you can pick up that conversation in Luke 18, verses 22 through 23. He said, and then Jesus heard this. He said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell all everything you have, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. In verse 23, it says, when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Have you ever met anybody who has worked hard, strived in all their life to obtain the pinnacle of success where still and were still unfulfilled? You know what the Bible says in Mark 8, 36? He says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? You know, if in an effort to obtain the things of this world, we miss the very things we need, the redemption of our soul. And it comes when we accept the fact that our Savior Jesus Christ died for our souls. Blood, his blood set us free, and the devil wants us to believe that it's anything but the blood. You know, it's, it's money, it's fame, it's fortune. Why are you toiling, toiling through life to obtain these things? I love this verse in Ecclesiastes 10.10. If the axe is dull and the age is unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill brings success. If the axe is dull, its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill brings success. You know, basically, if you're cutting through the forest of life and, and you're doing it apart from Jesus and trying to cut down those logs in life that stand in front of you with a dull axe. You're expending a lot of energy and you're exhausting yourself and you're not getting very far. But when you come to know Christ, that's, that, that's sharpening your axe. When you get to know him and through his word and through prayer and through fellowship, it's, you're sharpening your axe and that'll bring success. I mean, if you come here once a week and, that's, and there's 168 hours in a week, you spend one hour sharpening your axe, I'm going to tell you, you're not going to make it till next Sunday before you're exhausted again. You need to sharpen your axe daily in prayer and Bible study and reading. Isaiah 35, 3-4 says this, and I think this is the verse in the, in the uh, New Testament that's for the people of today in 2020. Strengthen, strengthen the feeble hands, study the knees, and give the way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with a vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Thank you. Dear God, I just thank you for today. I thank you for your love. I pray, God, if anybody here doesn't know you as your Savior, they would pray with me. Dear Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Come into my heart. And God, I pray that you would, would forgive me of my sins and help me to serve you for the rest of my days. And God, if there's anybody 
here that's prey deaf for the first time, may they contact us and tell us that uh, they need some help in their walk with you. And God, I pray for those who know you. God, God, we would diligently serve every day to strengthen our skills, that we can manipulate ourselves through the, 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 the challenges of life. In Christ's name.